working? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Perfect. All right. I think we are alive now. So I'm going to just delete the last stream. Take that down real quick. But people should be coming in in a second, which is good. And again, thank you, everybody. That's first chiming in for this episode of Rangers Review. Some technical difficulties through YouTube, at least. But just bear with me one second so I can get rid of the last one. Hold on. Come on. Get rid of the last one. I, I got the link. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> Yeah, and the poor camera quality is not on my end. It's just yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, people will chime in now. We'll get started in a second. <coughs> it definitely zoomed. Yeah, yeah, it is what it is. It's not a big deal. As long as the audio is fine. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, give me one more second and then we'll be good. Okay, all right, I think I think we are all set to go then. Apologies to everyone that's chiming in for the uh, delay and all that fun stuff. Unfortunately, I don't know why with uh, my software that I usually use to record our episodes, having some difficulties today, but no less, we troubleshoot. We, uh, we're doing it through Zoom now. That's why Steven just looks a little blurry, but trust me, he's so much better looking in person, I promise you. But still here for another episode of Rangers Review. Uh, we have a lot to discuss today. This is episode number 33 of Rangers Review, and yeah, we're going to be getting into a lot. We'll be doing an open Q&A towards the end, as always, myself alongside Sapboy Steven, but the bulk of the conversation today is going to be around the results so far a preseason for the Rangers our kind of you know uh expectations have they met them or not with certain players when it comes to position battles as well who's going to crack the fourth line and who's not who are going to be part of the final cuts going to the Wolfpack as we know there's only two games left of the preseason at the time being live here right now and the likelihood is that for the final two games according to according to Gerard Gallant, is that he would basically like his normal roster to be in there. So a lot of moves need to be had here in a short period of time to see who's going to crack these spots and who's not. How are the defensive pairs looking and all that fun stuff. And also taking a look at the minors, the affiliate for the Rangers, that being in the Hartford Wolfpack, and our expectations on how that roster is going to shape out. And kind of, you know, a quick preview slash prediction, if you will, before we get into the Q&A segment. So before we go any further, thank you all so much for their chiming in the Rangers review today. We'll be taking your questions plenty throughout the stream towards Towards the end, but no less. Steven, how are you doing today, my friend? Uh, I'm just happy NHL hockey is finally back. Uh, I know it's only preseason, but watching the Rangers four times in basically a week has been amazing. Yeah. I agree. It's it's been it's been kind of refreshing, right, to finally get Rangers hockey going again. And there's been a lot of exciting things about the preseason so far. And again, while it's preseason, and I know that you're not the person to say that, oh, it's just preseason, it doesn't matter, because it obviously does. But it's also important to take a look at how the Rangers have looked so far in preseason. And it's been some good, been some bad, been kind of in the middle. But it's been one thing that I think that I've appreciated the most personally more than anything else is just seeing a decent evenly distribute uh distribute distribution pardon me of the lines and the time on ice i like that a lot from what i've seen with gallant for the most part with these players no matter who's out there he's pretty much giving them all an even slate guys are getting more ice time now than what they probably will during the season or maybe just a little bit more but still what has kind of your initial reaction been to gallant's uh kind of coaching mindset here that we are now finally seeing on display in preseason steven yeah, it, it seems like there's a little bit more trust in the room and on the bench in uh, the coaching staff. Uh, you can tell that when the players are on the ice, they, they might not win every puck battle, but at least they they know what to do. You know, they, they're when they leave the bench. Oh, wait, Steven, Steven, not to cut you, I'm just going to cut you off for a second because people are apparently struggling to hear you. So let's get that fixed real quick. <sighs> Unbelievable. <laughs> I know. I really hate Zoom with a passion. It's such a crap application. All you need to do, look at your mic settings and see if your mic is connected. Uh, 
I'm using the built-in microphone for this one because the other mic was just having issues. <laughs> But are you still using it? Is it the same one as we've done before? No, this is just a built-in mic from my laptop. Oh, see, that's probably where the issue is rising then. Here, just give us one second. Apologies again for all the issues today, folks. Wasn't what we were intending on. I, I assure you that. All right, can you hear me fine? <laughs> I hear you fine. Uh, let's hear it with the chat. Um, guys, uh, Steven, talk for like another minute. Let's see how it sounds better or worse. All right, let's try it like this then. Okay, yeah. Uh, continue what you were saying, and then if they uh, they still uh, think it's a low, I'll, I'll try yeah, to fix it. When, pl when planes are being sent out on the ice, it just seems like they know what to do. You know, they're not being sent out there with... Uh, a million different assignments and and they just get lost in a shuffle no there's an actual game plan now and yeah the game against the devils was a little bit unfortunate but i think the two games against the bruins are a good indication of what this team can do they were playing against especially the second game against the bruins playing against their top line i really like what i'm seeing from this team and 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 early on how this coaching staff is dealing with it yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And uh, to answer the, in regards to the audio, I think I I think I'm getting it fixed now. I want to say actually, hold on one second. I think I got it better, right? Um, little better, but still hard. Slightly better, but way different from your mic. Or okay, okay. So what's the issue? Is it is it the volume or is it like? I think it's I think it's how people are hearing you. So it might be in connection with my software. So give me one second. I'm gonna try to do my part here. Uh, and we'll go from there. So I know, I know this is exactly what we want. It's how this to happen, Steven. This is exactly what we want. It is what it is. Um, I honestly don't know how zoom is so popular when it's so shit. <laughs> I know. Okay. Uh, let's see. Is it better? People saying in the chat, let me see you guys. Let me know how the audio is for Steven. Yeah. Let's see. Um, I, I changed some settings in Zoom, but other than that, this is pretty much any everything I can do. So, okay. Hmm. Volume's better now. Okay. All right, I think we're good. All right, so Stephen, what was your last note that you gave for us? <laughs> uh, no, I'm just happy with uh, the way the team looks under Gallant, especially the two games against Boston. Um, the last two games will be a good indication of what this team can really do. They'll be at, at close to full strength, um, and we'll see some some more familiarity with the lines. Of course, we saw a lot of the young kids in games one through four. Uh, and that affects the team's uh, performance. And if you look at the first game against the Islanders, the Islanders had a, lo had a lot more experience on, on the ice. Um, but I think the range overall have looked good in the two games against the Bruins, and hopefully they can build on that. Yeah, and I think it's important to look at how even the Rangers, after just getting decimated in their game against the Devils, right, where everything went wrong, went wrong defensively, and we'll be getting into that in a second, to see them kind of play against the Boston Bruins, even with them not having all their starters, was impressive in my mind. I think that is absolutely great to see. And I think what was awesome to see also was in the Rangers' most recent preseason game, just how they were all game long, and also their approach in overtime I thought was strong, and then ultimately that goal by Lafreniere, that was just great, such a stupid move by the goaltender Olmark for Boston, but for Lafreniere to get out in front of the net and just plan himself and then get that backhand easy shot goal was great. So I, I guess my next question to you now, when it comes to what has gone wrong for the Rangers here in preseason, what has been the most glaring things to you? Because I know what's stand out at me when it comes to certain players, but what is your first stance here, especially on the defensive side of things? Well, if you're looking at individuals, the two players that have been by far the biggest disappointment are Keandre Miller and Jacob Truba. Um, you expect more from those players because they are, as Galan said, they're guaranteed a spot in the lineup. You want them to show that they belong there. And honestly, what I've seen from them so far, I'm not convinced. And there's a lot of talk about that sixth defensive spot. Is it going to be Zach Jones? Is it going to be Nils Lundqvist? 
Um, I know I, I've gotten a lot of hate for this on Twitter, but if this was really an open competition, then Jones would be ahead of Miller based on what he has shown in preseason. Of course, seniority and reputation plays a part, and that's why Miller is in the lineup, but it's going to be an interesting uh, battle to watch Schneider versus Lundqvist and Jones versus Miller because I don't think players are guaranteed a spot for the whole season. <laughs> Um, I do think Lundqvist is going to get the um, the sixth spot on the third pairing with Patrick Nemeth, but the other two guys are really close. So it, it'll be interesting to see how that how that unfolds. Um, other than that, um, yeah, just the, the usual suspects that I expected to play poorly played poorly. Jared Tenordi, Libo Hayek. My expectations were low, and they were still disappointing. So, yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's been a huge conversation piece, and we went back and forth every day regarding Miller as well because, yeah, I'm not sure exactly why you're getting as much flack as you are because, look, um, it's been obvious that Miller hasn't had a great start going into training camp preseason. Mm -hmm. It's a little interesting, however, given that that isn't the viewpoint, at least from Gerard Gallant, from what we've openly seen. Like, he has made it noted that it's basically a lock with the top four pair of defenses, including Miller and Truba. Um, he's been awfully impressed with Miller and is really excited about him, and rightfully so. I think have, I think he's going to have a great future, Keandre, but <laughs> no less. I, I understand your argument, however, that kind of wanting the best guys on the ice that are proving it so far through training camp and preseason this year. I know that you've been very uh, strong behind the notion that you don't stand with uh, the belief that, oh, just because he played in the NHL last season is warranted of him being an absolute lock this year. And I understand that. that that's a perfectly fair argument to be had. Uh, unfortunately, I guess for your take there, that isn't something that's going to really resonate with how the Rangers are going to be operating. Again, I think it would be beyond far-fetched to see Keandre not start the season with the Rangers, but I think when you look at what is going to be huge for him this year, as we talked about prior, is how is he going to be able to handle, you know, the ebbs and flows of a normal season now, assuming that he's set to play the normal 82 game pace? And how is mm -hmm. guys that are currently below him, like a Jones, like a Niels Lundqvist, I would assume in, I assume it's going to be Jones that's on the outside looking in for this defense. If he continues to thrive the way he is and Miller has his struggles, at what point do you... Uh, like cut the leash if you will at what point do you reach that stopping yeah. point and say hey there should be a change even if it's not long term maybe to give kind of miller uh, a reality check if you will or something along those lines so what's your take on that it's interesting you mentioned the 82 game experience because ryan lindgren and adam fox haven't had an 82 game season either i know so it's going to be really interesting uh going into the season to see how this young defense is going to do. The only defensemen that have played an 82-game season are Jacob Truga and Patrick Nemeth. Mm -hmm. um, of course, Libor, Libor Hayek, <laughs> his career hasn't even played 82 games. Um, Jared Tenorti, I'm not 100% sure, but I doubt he has ever played 82 games in a season. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how this defense will do. But like I said, um, I, I I expected Miller to make the team out of camp. That was never really uh, that, that's not that's not a hot take. But I be I wouldn't be surprised if at some point during the season Jones will replace him, even if it's just for a couple of games. Where where Miller has a bad couple of weeks and they send him to Hartford for a week or two, just to you know to 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 get some some proper minutes in and. Um, and it's not a bad thing, you know. If they send Nils Lundqvist down to Hartford, that's a good thing. You know, they're, they're sending Braden Schneider to Hartford now. That's a good thing. It, it, Jones, Miller, those guys still have a lot to learn in the AHL. You know, it, it's it's not it, it's not that them being sent down makes them a failure. Um, and if this was maybe five or ten years ago, I would have had a big issue with young kids being sent down to Hartford because. For the longest time, the Hartford Wolfpack have been a graveyard for Ranger prospects, but with the system Drury put in place, with the guys that are in charge now in Hartford, the, <laughs> the changes that have been made over the last two years, I'm confident that they can actually do a good job developing talent. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And I also want to mention, because there were some people saying that it's still hard for them, they, them to hear Steven. Just put the volume up, guys. Again, uh, we apologize for all the technical difficulties today. We'll be fine. We're going to just, I think it's also safe to say, Steven, we'll leave this on the uh, 
the normal YouTube form. We'll do the podcast form next episode because people don't need to hear this butchering of the audios. It just it isn't worth their time. I don't want them on the drive home and they're like, why the hell do I only hear Tyler this entire time? But all jokes aside, yes, that's a great point that you brought up as well. And uh, for me personally, what I've noticed now when it comes to the Rangers development here and I, we're getting questions in the chat now, too, about why exactly is Miller being singled out? per se, and stuff like that. Well, let's start off with what we discussed last year, right? And that was Miller's inconsistencies after breaking camp and really surprising us all, correct? It, as you've alluded to, around, you know, March uh, of last season, that's where Miller really started to have his struggles. And I, I will be an advocate of that. He definitely was not consistent all year long as working here, no, nor did I expect it though either. And while I definitely believe that he is a key piece in this core group going forward, defensively in my opinion for sure i do not necessarily believe that it's outlandish to make the right critique but i think the bigger issue here is and let me know what your take is on this steven i don't have nearly as much of an issue with miller because i want him to get the playing time regardless on if he say fully deserves it or not i want him to get the development time in my bigger issue as i told you before is patrick nemeth and this is nothing personal against patrick nemeth this is again just the latest situation where the rangers have a defender veteran defender past his prime that is more than likely just going to be you know what you would expect given his career numbers on that bottom pair but he's on a multi-year deal for three years and he's blocking the future of guys like Zach Jones, who many do believe has very much aspects of his game that is very Adam Fox esque, but from the left side, he's looked great in training camp and preseason so far. Like, I have little to no complaints with Zach Jones whatsoever with what he's done, and I would absolutely love to see him in this lineup as soon as possible. So, my kind of question to you now is what do you think the repercussions of Patrick Nemeth are going to be, if anything? And while, yes, you have that veteran presence on that third pair, it's important. Yeah. Yes, they brought in him in because him and Niels that Swedish connection that's going to help him get it more acclimated, if you will. But at the end of the day, it's not going to do anything drastic. And if you're trying to make the put your best team out there while still playing your young guys and giving them development, I don't see how it's not the best of both worlds to have Miller in this lineup, obviously, which is bound to happen, but also Zach Jones over a guy like Patrick Nevith. But as we know, it simply won't happen with him being on this roster, given that contract. Yeah, and look, I'm not singling, like what you mentioned earlier, I'm not singling out K. Andre Miller. I have nothing against K. Andre Miller. The thing is, I see people online making the case that if this was fair and open competition, then Jones should be ahead of Niels Lundqvist. But by that same logic, if it was fair and open, then Jones should be ahead of K. Andre Miller. Jones is a left-handed defenseman. I don't think they're going to play a rookie defenseman out of position. Um making the NHL is hard enough as it is at that age. Um, and But yeah, Patrick Nemeth is another player that hasn't really stood out in preseason. But Patrick Nemeth was signed for three years, two and a half million a year. Um, that's the type of player that, that you don't send out there in preseason to earn his spot. You know, those kind of contracts are given out to players who are guaranteed a spot. Uh, same with Barkley Goudreau. There, there's no scenario where Barkley Goudreau has to earn his spot on the team. Um, when it, but when it comes to kids that haven't even played 100 <laughs> NHL games, I think it's, it, I think it's different. You know, you should look at what they do. And I mean, it, he wouldn't be the first defenseman to spend a couple of weeks in the AHL. I'm not, I'm not saying to send him there for the whole season. You know, but if Zach Jones starts in Hartford. And he dominates there. Why not just play him a couple of games in the NHL? Have Miller, you know, play a couple of games in the AHL to work work on his work on his game a little bit, and we'll may, maybe maybe work on his confidence. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but if you're going to play Jones instead of Nemeth, that's an interesting scenario. Uh, in that case, I would probably pair Jones with Truba and Miller with Lundqvist. Though. Okay. Yeah. And, and I agree with you. And I think that would bring benefits to both sides here. So I, uh, you know, this is something that we're going to be talking about a lot. I feel like into the season regarding the Rangers defensive pairs and 
more than anything, I think what will be best now from the Rangers, just from what we've seen at this point, again, it's very premature. It's very early. I'm aware of that. Just because Jones has looked fantastic, you know, leading up to this point does not necessarily mean that he's going to come out the gate guns a blazing. I, personally, would I like to see that? Do I think it's possible? Yes, but nothing's guaranteed. He has to prove himself, right? So uh, I think the route now for the Rangers that we'll be discussing further by the trade deadline is potentially Patrick Nemeth to deal. In this scenario where Jones is continuing to thrive, even in a scenario where he is starting every day for the Wolfpack on their top pair, right? And you have Nemeth, say, struggling, then yeah, I think that would be a perfect idea. Think of an Adam McQuaid situation a little bit again, if you will. Signing a guy, even though I know that they originally traded for him and even went lower in the draft with their draft pick they acquired after they dealt him. But the point is, though, that you sign a guy as a free agent, he will be somewhat um, of interest to teams, I'm sure, as long as he gets half a season and by the deadline and go from there. So with that being said, to kind of wrap up this up the discussion at this point on the defensive pairs as we know the rangers it looks like it's going to be a lock with ryan lindgren and adam fox we have looked stellar as always i'm excited to see what they're going to do again this season jacob truba is a guy that we need to see more i'm i've been somewhat concerned to put it lightly with how truba's done in preseason thus far i i'm really happy with how he did for the large majority of last season he really turned his year around in my opinion but i'm seeing a lot more of the jacob truba of old his first year with the rangers so far in training camp and in preseason so that needs to change and that needs to change fast because this is a guy that's still a key part of this defensive core going forward should he stay on the team he's on a big contract so you shouldn't expect him going anywhere anytime soon per se so i really need truba to step up along with miller we can't have it where there's an entire pair that just has defensive collapses left and right that's not going to lead to any success we know that but now shifting from defense side of things other than i would like to mention that mason geertsen uh the kind of goon if you will off the defensive side of things for the rangers has been picked up off waivers to yes the devils of course so the Rangers are trying to get him back to the Wolfpack. The Devils say, nope, we're going to take him very much. So now he's going to join um, another former Wolfpack defenseman, that being Ryan Graves, uh, for the actual New Jersey Devils. So, yeah, that's about it regarding defense for now. We'll go back, but actually, you know what? I'm an idiot. No, we're going to talk one more, one couple more minutes on defense, and that's your boy, Niels Lundqvist. I just want to really take a moment to appreciate just how damn good he's looked so far. Um, you know, last game, it, you know, two assists looked absolutely stellar. You can clearly tell tell his power play presence is known and that's something that i want to see a decent amount in the season truthfully and i do believe he's a lock to make this roster i think as good as jones has been i don't see how Niels is not starting the year with the rangers right as we have alluded to but yeah i really really like what i'm seeing from Niels. he's impressed me more and more every game and a beautiful yeah. stat that you came out with uh which was smart of you uh of recent was that while Niels has only played two preseason games and has been in those games where 11 goals have been scored he has not been on the ice for even one of them and he's only okay. been a the, I'm going to give you the updated stats on that because since okay. then they played the Bruins on Saturday. Oh, that's true. Go ahead. Uh, so Nils Lundqvist <laughs> has played in three preseason games. Uh, in those preseason three preseason games, the New York Rangers have scored five goals and conceded 14. Nils Lundqvist has been on the ice for four out of the five goals the Rangers scored and only one out of 14 they've conceded. Okay. He has three primary assists on those four goals. The only goal where he wasn't on the ice was the Kevin Rooney penalty shot. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, N Niels has really been something special. And uh, from your side, things as someone that's been following him so heavily all throughout his career, uh, you know, if, if if you guys aren't aware, Stephen has a very good connection with Niels and even his family ever since the Rangers drafted him. It's literally been a match made in heaven between these two. So uh, from your side, things, what have you noticed the most about Niels? And do you think his game is transitioning smoothly the way that I think it has so far in North American ice and kind of getting into the season now? Just how excited are you to see him potentially be commanding, say, at least one of the two power plays and really gain a good amount of ice time each and every game? Yeah, for me, the biggest question was, <laughs> how will Niels Lundqvist do defensively? Like, the offense was never really a question mark for me because the way he provides offense, the way he produces in the SHL, that really translates well to the NHL. My biggest question was, how is he going to do defensively? Uh, you know, the higher pace hockey, the forwards are a little bit more physical in the NHL. But I've been pleasantly surprised. Um as you remember, I brought this up with you uh, a couple of days ago. The first game against the Islanders, the Rangers were on the power play, and he goes into the corner to get the puck, and Casey Zizekas is trying to push him off the puck. Mm -hmm. And Nils Lundqvist just shrugs him off like he's nothing. Yeah. And 
Yes, yeah, Ezekiel is not the biggest guy, but he's a, he's a physical guy. He's a guy that that throws the body around, and Nils Lundqvist it wasn't wasn't bothered by it at all. And it was a similar situation. Yes, uh, on Saturday against the Bruins, I forget who it was, um, but behind his own net, uh, he he just he just a Bruins player just bounced off him. And this is a kid that's five eleven, and I've said in the past. He might be 5'11", but he plays like he's 6'4", because his center of gravity is in such a perfect position that he he really uses his body well and and knows how to position himself to to not get um, to not get get pushed off the puck. Um, so I'm very happy to see that. I'm happy to see that that translates to two. And of course, three primary assists in three games. He leads the Rangers in scoring in the preseason together with Panarin. Um, uh, offensively, he's done everything I could have hoped for. And <laughs> defensively, he has surprised me because honestly, I thought he would need a little bit more time to, um, you know, to get used to that. But overall, I've been very happy. Of course, Jones is the flashier player on defense. Um, probably a little better at skating. Jones is Jones is like Adam Fox light. Uh, yeah. He, Nils Lundqvist also does things Adam Fox does really well, but I think I think they are both. I think Adam Fox is sort of like a, a, a fusion of Nils Lundqvist and Zach Jones for Dragon Ball Z fans. If, <laughs> if, if Nils Lundqvist and Zach Jones would do a fusion dance, the results Adam Fox. Um, but I'm just happy to have both these guys on the team, and I, I, honestly, they they both deserve to be on the team the way they played in the preseason. Um, and I'm just I'm just excited to see where this is gonna go. Regardless of what happens, last thing I want to say about our defense, can we just take a moment and appreciate the situation we're in right now? Yes. We are talking about playing Nils Lundqvist or Zach Jones, where for years we were talking about Michael Kostka and Jeff Wojvitka and, <laughs> and Stu Bickle and Nick Holden and all these other third-pair defensemen that were absolute dog shit. Now we have a defense where, worst case scenario, we have a guy like Zach Jones or Nils Lundqvist <laughs> playing in Hartford. Yeah, no, and, it, it's an embarrassment of riches, as we Braden, alluded to. Braden Schneider. We haven't even talked about Matthew Robertson. I know. Might have, been, might have been a little bit disappointing this preseason, but Matthew Robertson on most NHL teams will be a top three prospect. Mm -hmm. For sure. On this team, he's closer to number 10. Yeah. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. So I'm I'm happy that we're in this situation where we don't have to worry about defense. Whoever wins has whoever wins that spot has earned it, and whoever doesn't, you trade him for 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 other pieces. It's the perfect scenario. It's it's the sign of a good rebuild, and unfortunately, the price we pay as fans of a good rebuild is that we're going to say goodbye to players that we grew close to players that we got to care for during the rebuild. There yep. will be some names that will not be on the Rangers by the time we lift the cup. I know. And that's just the reality of the situation. I feel like we've been talking about that a lot uh, during the off season as well, but you know, that's just something that's inevitable. And you could think about going back to the 1994 Rangers and not to get on a ta tangent here, but look at what they had to do to get to where they want to be and actually win it all that year. They had to part ways with some guys that were, huge performers on the Rangers that year um you know Mike Gardner being I think the most notable right so uh even though that you could have a long-staying attachments with certain players at the end of the day you need to do what's in the best interest of winning and hopefully having more longevity to the winning uh, unlike the Rangers 94 run that was short-lived after that right but uh, the point is, is that they have a core group now that they're building and they simply have more than they can handle in a positive note. So we are going to be parting ways with guys that we have been attached to, as you've alluded to already. And I think that's important to look at going forward on um, that, knowing that when the Rangers do say make these deals or part ways with the, these guys, that's just they make sure that's in the best interest of the club and that's not going to hurt them, say, long term, giving up on one guy. You want to make sure that's really a positive, positive, positive. Both teams win in these scenarios for the most part. So before we go forward, I just want to say thank you again to everybody that's been chiming into this episode of Rangers Review. We apologize for the technical difficulties. Again, we should be perfectly fine next episode a week from now or so. But no less, we do apologize no less. And we'll be taking questions towards the end of the show per usual. But now, Stephen... <coughs> 
I want to get into kind of the status of the roster and specifically the fourth line battle. Because as we know, there are still a couple guys left trying to leg this one out. And one of the guys that is uh, ver very much making a good case to be in this bottom six. And I feel very comfortable you saying that. Libor Hayek, no, no. And I'm glad you brought him up because, yes, Libor Hayek was practicing on the fourth line for the Rangers today, doing his best Brendan Smith impression. Can we go one year without this shenanigans? But Gerard Gallant literally just said it was according to Vince McCurgliano, shout out Vince, uh, who, covers him, uh, who covers the Rangers, a really good beat reporter for them, said that there was nothing to it. Uh, Gallant just wanted him to be out on the ice so they have even eight defensemen out there. So that's fine. Just give him ice time and practice. It is what it is. But it was, it was comical, to put it lightly, to see him out there on that fourth line i'm like dear god please no but getting on to now uh the fourth line for the rangers right there's a lot of options here and vitaly krasov as we know is still out with injury he will not be going on the trip for the rangers uh to cap off their preseason uh so there's no update on him but he's day-to-day -day as of now that's going to benefit obviously a guy like julian gautier for some foremost you'd have to imagine uh julian looked really strong from what i've seen in preseason thus far i've really been liking his game his guy i would love to see on this on this roster but between having just too many guys right now and Sammy Blay having a good game recently for the Rangers that we've seen, I've been liking his physical presence as well and his net front presence. Uh, what is your take right now on the status of the fourth line, Stephen? And among all the options that we have right now, who do you think is actually going to make the most sense? Um, I think the starting fourth line will be Sammy Blay, Kevin Rooney, and Ryan Reeves. Mm -hmm. Um. And I think the Rangers are going to go with two spare forwards in Dryden Hunt and Julien Gauthier. Uh, with, unfortunately, Morgan Barron starting in Hartford. Um, and it's not necessary because Hunt and Gauthier have been better than Barron. But it's all about not losing players for nothing. Exactly. Uh, Barron is waiver exempt, so he can be sent down without any consequences. They don't want to lose Julien Gauthier for nothing after, you know... They traded for him a year and a half ago. They he survived the expansion draft. They signed him to a one year extension. They they don't want to lose him for nothing. So it's either going to be a trade where they acquire a prospect or a pick, or they're going to go with uh, with two spare forwards going into the season, hunting Gautier. But I think that fourth line is pretty much settled. Uh, the third line is probably going to be Kraftsov, Hedel, Goudreau. I don't think there's any question there. And then the top six lines, because it's difficult to call a line the first line and, and the other one the second line. I know, you always say this. <laughs> I mean, I personally rank lines based on the best player. So I would rank the Panarin line the first line. But then the Zibanejad line is the second line. It doesn't make sense. But on the if you flip it around, I'm having the same the same issue. I, I cannot I cannot say Panarin is a second line winger. It just uh... so anyway, top six top six lines is going to be Panarin, Strom, Kako, and then Lafreniere, Zibanejad, Kreider. I don't think there's any secret there. <laughs> no, I, I don't think there is either. And while you and I have been advocating for a Kreider third line, thinking that would just be so balanced to make things ideal, um, to a little surprise, I would say it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Um, especially for a guy that may more than likely become anointed as the next Rangers captain, which we should be finding out very, very soon with the Rangers seasons just starting, you know, a week from now or so. I'm, a, I'm looking forward to that announcement as well, whenever it's going to come. But I would like to mention that while this guy has been cut already, and, you know, as we've seen, a, a lot of major uh, roster cuts have happened for the Rangers already with guys going to the Wolfpack. I want to touch quickly on one guy before I kind of just share my overall thoughts on this offense, and that is the same guy that I've been viewing probably more highly than anyone else, just given my excitement. That's Lori Payunemi. I've been unbelievably satisfied with what I saw from Laurie for the most part in these preseason games. Had endless opportunities. Unfortunately, got robbed recently in the in the game uh, against the Devils. Oh. Bernier just literally just. How did Bernier keep that out? That was unbelievable. Uh, Jonathan Bernier had a very prime Jonathan Bernier type game, uh, given where he at, or given where he's at in his career. Yeah. Um, but no less, uh, I really liked what I'm seeing from Laurie. He's, he's handling himself in the offensive zone just fine. I'm um, settling in that left dot, whether it's on five on five special teams, has a great shot that he's ripped off the bar a couple times now. So, yeah, Pai Yunemi, 
Really like him. I'm excited to see what he's going to do for the Wolfpack. And we'll be talking about that a little bit more when we get into the Wolfpack discussion. But overall on the offense, what I'm seeing right now is I tend to agree with you with that fourth line. I think that's more than likely what we are going to see. My only critique that I have in regards to Ryan Reeves is the following. I do not want to see Ryan Reeves play every single game for the Rangers this year. I hope that this is a scenario where the Rangers can be more nitpicky on it, if you will, where his role makes more sense than not. Because when I see Ryan Reeves on that fourth line, my concern is that you're not going to see a fairly balanced distribution of those lines, especially when you get into that bottom six, when that could be, you know, prohibiting the, uh, growth if you will if Kevin Rooney game rise time say when it's deserving or Sammy Blay for example as well or maybe even Julian Gauthier if he gets time on that fourth line as well uh, depending on injuries so for me personally that's just my biggest critique uh, I don't have any any real big issues with Reeves he's actually a guy that can help you to a certain extent offensively not much at all but he can definitely bring you more than I think what has been the case with a lot of Rangers enforcers over the past two decades so Ryan Reeves we'll see what he yeah. will bring um, Look, I, I think I think Reeves is better than what the, what Ranger fans were expecting. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, he's also not the player he was three, four years ago. Exactly. We have to understand that you know he's in his mid thirties. He's not going to be as effective as he was when he was with the Penguins uh, and with the Blues. Did he play with the Blues as well? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so. Um, he's going to have his value. I think the guy that is really going to stand out is Sammy Blay. Um, he's going to exceed expectations. Uh, I've been really impressed with him this this season. Agreed. Preseason. Yeah, he's looked nice. Um, and then, of course, the guys that you mentioned, Payu Yemi, but also the younger kids like Offman and Cooley. Yeah. Um, I'm really happy that they go back to the OHL, having played professionally last season and then joining an NHL training camp. And then taking that experience back to the OHL uh, to play for, in Cooley's case, the Windsor Spitfires, and in Offman's case, the Flint Firebirds. Um, it's going to be interesting to, to follow them in the OHL this year, see how they do. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if Cooley, a year from now, just makes the team. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised either. Look at how look at how well he did in training camp. And every, like, seriously, like he might... He Will yeah. Cooley really looks like what Brendan Lemieux would never amount to be, and then some. That's what I'm seeing. Will, Will Cooley is what the Rangers hope Brendan Lemieux would become. Exactly my my point. Yeah. So I, I'm 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 looking forward to him. I, not to get ahead, you know. Let's focus on the now, right? But the point is, is that. There's a lot of positive signs for these youngsters. And Will Cooley is definitely what beyond expectations. And for a guy that going into, you know, when he was drafted, had a strong skill set, I, you know, models his game similar to Tom Wilson, more so for the good than the bad, just being more hard-nosed, is willing to defend himself right, but can also bring you some offensive production. I think Will Cooley has the perfect definition of a top nine winner in this Rangers core group over the next couple of years. So yeah, I, I agree with you. I I'm looking forward to him. It sucks. That he can't start the year with a Wolfpack this year. Um, <laughs> given that he was only two games off uh, from actually uh, being able to do so. But besides that, Will Cooley, I'm looking forward to him and more so on this Rangers offense, Sammy Blay. I think he's going to become a, a fan favorite fairly quickly from what we've seen. Um, not just between his overall presence. You know, Blay is someone that I've liked quite a bit since the Blues originally brought him up into the actual uh, NHL. Uh, you know, him being a part of the Blues and their Stanley Cup run, him dealing with injuries though as well. He's had some key moments. Um, I also remember trying to think, did Sammy, I think Sammy Blay. Did he score a goal on the Rangers opening night after the Blues won the Stanley Cup? I think it wouldn't surprise me. I think he did. I'm almost certain he did. If the Rangers, okay, the I'm gonna, I'm gonna look it up. While did the Rangers? The Rangers the played the Blues uh, when they uh, right after they won the Stanley Cup, right? I think that was the Blues opener. I'm um, almost yeah. certain. <laughs> uh, so that was 2019, 2020. Um, no. So they played them on January 11th, and Sammy Blade did not score. Okay, I'm thinking of a different game then. My mistake. You know, this is why you shouldn't trust me, and this is why we have you, the staff boy over here, to actually figure everything out. But no, I didn't know you. I'm just looking it up. I'm just, I'm just. Fast. No, that's fine. Thank you. I don't want to give people false information. I feel like I tend to do that. 
But still, uh, the point is Sammy Blay. I, I think that he's going to be a pretty good X Factor for the Rangers and I'll balance things. And I've also liked what I've seen from Barkley Goudreau as well. Um, just overall, I'm pretty satisfied from what everyone's been doing at this point. The guys offensively, you know, Alexi Lafreniere, I think Alexi's looked pretty damn good for the most part in preseason. Um, I'm I'm intrigued by him. Capo Caco has looked like an absolute horse. Can we take a moment to talk about Capo, right, going into now the season? He doesn't... He doesn't look like a completely changed man, but my point is he has so much more confidence behind him, I feel like. He's, you know, built more muscle weight over the offseason. He just looks like a man you do not want to mess with, and I'm seeing more and more of those similarities to, as what I've talked about prior, I've compared Kako to a certain extent with the build of Evgeny Malkin, but being obviously more defensively responsible, one of Sasha Barkov, Huberto. I'm seeing all of those kind of aspects in Kako's game, uh, which each game that we're actually seeing out there in the preseason. So, the youngsters I'm really happy about. Philip Hedl, I haven't been stellar about preseason. Um, he has some hurdles that I think he still needs to get over, but I'm still looking forward to seeing what Hedl is going to do going into the year. Um, so offensively, um, outside of the youngsters, who would you say has impressed you the most outside of the couple that I've listed? Outside of the youngsters? No, no, of the youngsters that I've listed. Who would you say has impressed you the most? Um, honestly, I haven't been too impressed with Kako this preseason. I really like him on the penalty kill. I, I and I think that's a good fit for him as well to fill Buchnevich's spot. Um, but that game against Boston on Saturday, I, I wasn't impressed with either Lafreniere or Kako. I think they both had pretty disappointing games. Even okay. Though it, it turned into a win, and Kako had that uh, shorthanded breakaway, of course, where he drew a penalty, um, and Lafreniere scoring in overtime. Um. Yeah. Who who's been who's been the most impressive? It's it's a tough one. Um. Um. I haven't really been imp impressed with a lot of the the young forwards, to be honest. Um, Have they just kind of been there for you? Like nothing. Yeah. yeah I, I I I can understand that. Sort of meeting expectations, not exceeding expectations. If that makes sense. At a standstill. Um. Look, it's just, you know, I was really impressed with, of course, Panarin, who had three points in a game, and then and he just, he just, he just dominated again. It's it's what Panarin does. We're truly um, spoiled with just how good yeah. Panarin is. Ban like Zbanjad's beauty, yeah. beauty of a goal against the Devils, doing the way he yeah. normally does. It, it's um, it's a pleasure to watch. He's not a younger guy, but Kevin <laughs> Rooney, I'm, I'm really impressed with Kevin Rooney. The fact that he, at, at such a late age, uh, you know, comes to the Rangers and he's reinvented himself in, a little bit within a year cements himself in the lineup to the point where he's protected in the expansion draft. I don't think anyone expected that to happen. No. Um, but he, he just seems like a good fit. You know, he's not a superstar player on your team, but this is the perfect guy for a fourth line role. You want someone on your fourth line that is a good fit with the team. And he seems like he, he fits right in. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, and I think uh, to add slightly on Rooney, what we noticed last year and, you know, what David Quinn became more abundantly clear for him and good, good on Quinn during that time as well, because a lot of people were upset with Rooney gain ice. I wasn't loving it at first either, but, you know, between not just what he brings five on five and his limited role, but the fact that he is defensively sound, you know, he can handle face offs at times being that PK presence as well. The Rangers haven't had too much uh, really solid forwards to help out on the PK. Ones that should be there that are part of the bottom six. I don't want to see Mika's badge out on the penalty kill constantly. Pavel Buchnevich, as good as he was, I didn't want to see him constantly there either to a certain extent. So Rooney is one of those guys that's really going to come up clutch for the Rangers, more so on special teams potentially than anything else. And that's huge for them given the kind of roster configuration that they have to this point. And, and the biggest improvement this team has made is the fourth line, let's be clear. Yep. Um, we basically replaced Brandon Lemieux, Brett Howden, and Phil DiGiuseppe with Sammy Blay, Kevin Rooney, and Ryan Reeves over the last 10 months. Yeah, that, that's pretty good when you're think, uh, putting all things into consideration. Yeah. And uh, regarding not just when it comes to Rooney, but also I'm thinking about the Rangers' decision to – part ways with guys like a calm Blackwell over someone like potentially a Rooney when you're giving mm -hmm. this like for them to commit to Rooney as you alluded to it really gives is a testament to how much mm -hmm. he's grown uh trust within the Rangers organization in a very short period of time 
And and you know what? The whole expansion draft decision to protect Rooney over Blackwell, I know it wasn't very popular with the fan base. Rightfully so, I th- I think. If if you look at it like objectively, didn't it make a ton more sense to protect a center over a winger? Yes, especially with how that winger was being utilized under Quinn. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's important. More sense to, if you're going to choose between Blackwell <laughs> and Rooney, when all your fans are complaining about your lack of depth at center, Rooney is the obvious candidate to get protected there. And I know it's still early. You know, we're only, we're only a couple of preseason games in, but I like what I'm seeing from the guy. I like what I saw from the guy last season, especially the last month or so. You know, he really stepped up his game. Yeah, no, he absolutely has. And I'm excited too because I'm gonna be I'm gonna be honest with you. I haven't been able to watch every preseason game fully, like at all, given my schedule. But now that baseball is coming to a close for me with my Mets, I know we me. Yeah. I'm actually I'm yeah. I'm gonna be fully yeah. invested now starting Wednesday. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm really yeah. pumped. I feel like I don't have to ask you exactly who is your biggest standout outside of what I saw from like the twenty minutes of highlights, right? So mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to it. I really am. <laughs> So one last thing I'll say about Kevin Rooney, just to give you a glimpse into his character. Um, Back in, I think it was in March, the Rangers played a game against the Devils and the Rangers scored six goals. Um, As you know, my fiance likes to collect goal pucks. She was at that game. Um, So she managed to get her hands on five of the six goal pucks from that game for the Ranger goals. That's awesome. Uh, Today she found out that the sixth puck is probably not going to be available because Kevin Rooney kept it. And the person she she spoke to that told her this said that the reason Kevin Rooney wanted to keep that goal puck is because it was the goal he scored against his former team for the team that actually gave him a chance. So he considers the Rangers the team that actually gave him a shot. Wow, that's wow, that's 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 heartwarming. That's actually really awesome to hear. You know, now now I'm even a big Kevin Rooney lover. Okay, I'm I'm wishing him the best. I want him to have a dominant shutdown fourth line year. Listen, that penalty shot against the Bruins must have must have really solidified his spot in the hearts of Ranger fans. Right? It it, it, it feels like with each passing day, like he's there used to be a lot of criticism towards him that I'd see on Rangers social media. Now I see a little to nothing. Oh. Like, do, do you remember? You remember the moment he was mocking Tom Wilson on the bench? Oh, yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> That's just exactly. <laughs> This guy's a hero. He is a hero. You think you? What do you think Rooney would have done if he if he went toe to toe with Tom? Not I, I. You know nothing fantastic. Let's put it lightly. Yeah. So to see him be that, I, I love that. You know that when that moment happened, that I was like, all right, give him the max. Like he ain't going anywhere. It was it was a start of something special. Um, that was that was, that was beautiful. Yeah, that but was amazing. I, I want to pivot to something quick, and uh, and I think our viewers will find this a little interesting too. So if you guys don't know, Steven's fiance is as diehard of a Ranger fan as you will meet uh, from everything that I know. Very much like Steven. That's why they they're so compatible. They work so well together, right? Um, but. I'm almost certain, and I don't, I can't bet on it, but I remember years ago, a couple years ago now, it's been a while, maybe three, four years ago, I was at a Rangers game. It was either the home opener uh, for the first year under David Quinn, or it was, it might have been the home opener, I think. And I was walking around, and it was kind of by the point of like where the buses would come in, like for the players and stuff on uh, MSG, and there were fans waiting to see if they could catch some autographs. And I saw like one girl that was really hyped in it and, like really pumped about it. And I, I can almost, I'm, I'm, I'm almost hundred percent. It was her because if she, I, you're confident she goes to like a lot of games, right. And she normally is waiting. Does she constantly wait for players for signatures and stuff like that? Is that something you think uh, she, that she's done? No, this is not necessarily signature. She just, you know, like, like she likes to get it, get a picture taken with a, with a player. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, you know, unfortunately <laughs> there are some people who, who stand out there waiting in line, you know, that they're waiting with like boxes full of pucks and have players sign like, Oh uh, yeah. No, they're um, schmucks. I don't even have one signed puck. Terrible. Like to put things in perspective, I have nothing like, but again, I'm not that type of person to be like, go up there and give everything. Like if you I, know, if, and, you, if you have players sign a puck and you, and you keep them, you know, for your own collection or you give it to a friend or whatever, fine. But these are guys that are just standing there. Oh, they're resellers. Just, yeah, they just sell, sell them on eBay. It's just terrible. Terrible. Yeah, but besides the point, I just want to say that because I'm almost certain it was her. 
And I just find that funny thinking about years later on how That's everything awesome. has kind of been connected between you and her and where you guys are at now, which is as awesome as it is. So getting away from that subject matter now, um, to wrap up really the Rangers and the current status of the team, not just offensively, defensively, going into now what is going to be two more preseason games that they have coming up, and then that's going to start their season. They will be in D.C., correct? Their first game's D.C. They have back-to-back -back for their first games of the season. Yeah, and their first home game is against the Dallas Stars, yes. I think. Yes, very exciting times for sure. We're just around a week away or so. But at the roster, how it looks like right now, uh, if you in case you guys are wondering or aren't aware, it's Morgan Barron, uh, who we assume is going to start the year with the Wolfpack. Sammy Blay, Filipito, Julian Gauthier, Barkley Goudreau, Dryden Hunt, Capo Caco, Vitaly Kravtsov, who's currently injured day-to-day, -day, Chris Kreider, Alexi Lafreniere, Greg McKegg, who is actually no longer with the team. He was put on waivers, so as long as he clears, he will be going to the Wolfpack. Sorry, Greg. Uh, the Panarin, Reeves, Rooney, Stroms, Banjad, defensively, Fox, Hayek, Jones, Lindgren, Lundqvist, Miller, Nemeth, Tenorti, Truba, and then Georgiev and Igor, obviously, are your goaltenders. So now getting into kind of the Wolfpack, Stephen, what's your take now as we kind of have a pretty good expectation on what this Wolfpack roster is going to uh, show out to be? And I think it's by far the most exciting one that we've seen in a while now. Yeah, that defense. I mean, we're talking about the Rangers defense, but oof. let's talk about the, the Wolfpack defense for a sec. Um Let's let's assume Lundqvist makes makes the team as a sixth defenseman in New York. You're looking at a defense in Hartford that has Robertson and Schneider, um, Jones and Skinner, and then Rayunanen and Tenorti, Beteto, maybe Hayek. That's that's a very talented blue line for the Hartford Wolfpack. It's a little light on experience. Um, so I don't know if they're going to do something there. Maybe maybe sign a veteran defenseman. There's also this situation in Hartford where they, they often play three, de three days in a row. So players might not play all three games in one of those weekends. So you need you need a little bit more. You need more defensemen on your team for that. And yeah, offensively, um, I think the two that stand, or the three players to me that stand out the most are Morgan Barron, Justin Richards and Lori Payuniemi, that should be your top line. Uh, those are your three, the three players with the best chances of making the team. And then you have guys like Rodzinski, uh, Kodorenko, uh, Gettinger. Ronning is still is still there, of course. Yep. Um, he never got a shot, really, unfortunately. I, I'm not surprised, but you know, I, I just feel for some, him. Some players, some players are just fan favorites, and. They will never get a shot with the team. It's unfortunate, but it is what it is. You know, um, again, a victim of the rebuild. If this was 2015, he'd be on the team. He'd, yeah. he'd, he'd at least play a couple of games. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, but just, just, just a victim of, of the rebuild. Um, and let's also not forget Carl Henriksen, who's back in Sweden because he's not eligible for the AHL. Um, he will be eligible to play in Hartford in 2023, uh, which will be his third year of his entry-level contract. So we'll see what happens there. But the Rangers have some center depth. It's not great, but at least there's some center depth with uh, with Baron Richards and Henriksen. Yeah. And I think what's most exciting, as we've alluded to already, is the defensive pairings, the alignment. Um, seeing a lot of these guys are about to have an impact on the Rangers very soon. But I'm, cur I'm curious now, going into the season for Hartford, not so much on just, you know, what the pro what prospects will be there. We know who's going to be there, right? A lot of exciting young talent. But how are they going to gel now under this full pack system? Uh, it's something that's still been a little ever-changing uh, in recent years. has changed a lot from not just the coaching to the GM now and everything. So this is going to be a big test to see exactly how the Rangers continue their development. And it might be one of those things where it could be in the best interest of some of these players to really give them a, uh, you know, a certain type of free time, you know, uh, what's the type, right word I'm looking for? Just a certain type of leeway, if you will, when it comes to honing their own game and not doing too much, 
but just giving the allowance to focus in on what they've done to get to them to where the point that they are now. Because that's something that the Rangers have struggled with, not just in their affiliate for Hartford, but with the Rangers in recent years in this rebuild. And I think for them to have their continued success and, deve and to develop properly, they need to make sure that they're under a system that's culturally both comfortable and also giving them that kind of, you know, you know, confidence booster saying hey we know what you've done to this point just continue to do just that and we'll critique you give you little tweaks as you go but yeah. overall we just want to see more of the same from you right and i think that's important for some of these guys yeah i think it's important for the Hartford wolf pack to have the right identity um, yeah and this is something that i, I mentioned this before but uh, <laughs> i think it was nikita kucherov years ago when he was interviewed about playing for the syracuse crunch um, he said that playing for the Syracuse Crunch felt like he was playing for the Tampa Bay Lightning because everything in Syracuse reminded him of, of Tampa Bay. Um, the way the coaches talk. Uh, and it's something as simple as, as their, uh, their, their jerseys. Of course, the Hartford Wolfpack's not going to change, but I wish they would. You know, I wish they would be the Hartford Rangers or they move to Westchester, become the Westchester Rangers. But What's important is that the, the coaches in Hartford make them play the same system that the Rangers play in New York. Because ultimately, that's what the Wolfpack's for. Would it be fun to see the Wolfpack win the Calder Cup? Yeah, of course. You know, that's 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 the championship in the AHL. That, that's uh, one team is going to win it. Why not have it be your team? But the number one goal is to prepare players for the New York Rangers. And if you're going to play a completely different system in Hartford, then it's not going to work. And, and that has been one of the many issues in Hartford over the last decade and a half. Um, now with Ryan Martin in charge there as the, uh, as the general manager, uh, hopefully we'll see some changes. I'm very confident in the coaching staff they have over there. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how, how many prospects actually make their way from Hartford to New York. Yeah, no, agree with you. And I'm looking forward. I know you'll be attending at least one Wolfpack game this year. So I'm hoping that's a good time. I'll be, I know I'll be attending the same uh, whenever they're playing the Phantoms, especially because that's where I'm usually given where the Phantoms reside. It's not far from me at all. So I'm looking forward to them as well. Um, and to now kind of wrap up a couple more pieces I want to touch with you before we get into the Q&A for the last 10 to 15 minutes or so here in this episode of Rangers Review number 33 um, is let's start off with <coughs> what the Gerard Gallant was showing today right because he if you look at the power play setup um, I was waiting to have a little bit of a critique with you I'm just hoping that this doesn't necessarily come to fruition uh, when the season begins but it is possible and that is the all righty power play number one um, something that you and I have not been in favor of were open advocates against it last season and i do not want to hear more of the same argument but it may be the case here between having zabaja on the left dot panarin in the right having stroman center and then of course having your two righties and i believe that would be in right truba and fox on defense so that's that's overkill for me that's something that i am not intrigued by uh, so what's your initial take on kind of seeing the power plays roll out in practices right now? How much stock do you think we should put into them? If any, I think we should put a decent amount, right? Um, and do you think that's the best route? Because I, I surely don't, if I'm being quite honest with you. I mean, what else can we say? Um, Gallant is using the exact same power play unit as David Quinn did. <laughs> um, I don't know. Four, four right-handed shots on one power play. And then four left-handed shots on the other. It, it it just feels like you're limiting your your power play units that way. But um, I think everything I could possibly say about that I've already said over the last ten months. Um, we'll see what happens. We'll see what changes during the season. Yeah. No, I. I, I, I the only left-handed shot on that on that first power play unit is Chris Kreider, who has his butt parked in front of the goalie. Yeah. It just doesn't make sense. No, I'm, you know, we both have not been in favor for it for good reasons. So, so we'll whoever's, whoever, whoever's in the middle, it doesn't matter. And whoever's on the point doesn't matter. But on the left and on the right, you, you cannot have, you cannot have a right-handed shot on the right side and, and, and expect it to work. 
we saw last season that every time we scored on the power play, it went through Panarin because Strom on the other side is just position wrong. Yep. So just, it's some it's something that I really hope changes. I hope that they don't adopt uh, the same Quinn uh, mindset with the power plays going into the year again. It might be one of those things that's ever changing. Thing is, the other thing is, I would never have Strowman's advantage at on the same power play because I want to win the face off on the second <laughs> unit as well. Bingo! Thank you. That's another. That's not another obvious pick as well. Um, and honestly, Phil Hedo is not winning you a face off on the power play. No, not consistently. No. And I will say though, and something that we haven't touched on in our uh, past episode because I don't think it happened was just Gallant bringing in his former teammate to help with faceoffs. Something that we have been heavy advocates for, and I'm I'm really happy that they you could tell that the Rangers have, uh, at least according to Gallant and from what's been reported, actually be more influenced on getting better at faceoffs. Because as we know, the Rangers have just been so god awful in faceoffs for years now. And while yes, I don't I agree that faceoffs don't drastically change everything about a game, but let's be real here. If you're a better faceoff team than the opposing team, you naturally have more opportunities to score. You have better opportunities to stay in your defensive zone. Um if say the opposing team has has a power play. If you win that face off, that's huge get out of the zone quicker. Uh if you have if you're on the power play, it gives you a better opportunity to actually score if you keep it in the zone by winning that face off. There's all these different factors that go into it but the moral story is i'm happy that the rangers were working on more and i hope that because i've seen them they've had some good face-off games in preseason so far i hope that transitions now going into the season um and one final tidbit i want to share with you steven as we originally touched on as you brought up to me originally was what was reported right on september 30th from vince mccurgliano and this was ryan strone's comments about gerard Gallant. And this is important. I want to make sure we talked about it. And it's the following. Uh, Strom said Gallant is in the locker room less than Quinn, leaving ownership on players to lead. According to Strom, he says the following, and I quote, The number one thing is the systems are a lot simpler. It's not rocket science what we're doing out there. It's just about executing it. It creates a little bit less thinking for us. And something that you may note of, I'm glad he did, because that's huge i think giving you know not just accountability but trusting your players and faith is how you help build the culture that they're trying to build right now you know give them that leeway right uh gerard Gallant is a seasoned vet when it comes to being a coach in the league of the nhl and he's going up to them and saying hey you know i know what i know what to expect out of you go out and do it let's get less micromanaging it's something that i felt like we saw almost on an everyday basis under david quinn and line by line ship by shift right it, it always happened i think there's going to be a very different approach here with Gerard Gallant from what we're seeing I'm very encouraged to hear those comments from Ryan Strom because I think that's the best way to get this culture built within the group and to have in-house leadership as well more than anything uh not feeling belittled at times if you will about being micromanaged just let everyone kind of do their job we know why they're there help them out when they need but you know this is a pros game at the end of the day we shouldn't have to be you know helping them step by step they know what to expect at this point yeah and that actually reminded me of the um, the interview Ryan Spooner gave a couple of months ago. Um, and I don't want to turn this into a David Quinn thing again, but um, a couple of months ago, Ryan Spooner was, he was asked about David Quinn. And he said uh, that he just, he, he always put them out there with too many assignments, you know, too many instructions. He said um, that he spends more time focusing on little details than just letting the team play. And he goes, I found for me at least, I spend more time focusing on this rule he had about not stick handling on a two-on-one. You have to crash the net every time. And no matter where you are, I spend more time focusing on sprinting around the ice, crashing the net, keeping the puck on my forehand than I did actually playing hockey. Mm -hmm. And it really, it really makes sense if you look at the Rangers over the last three years. They were being sent out there with too many assignments. They, they were being micromanaged by a coach who is micromanaging his players because that's what he's used to. If you're coaching a college team, you micromanage them because you're talking about players for whom college will be the highest level they'll ever achieve. Yep. 90%, maybe even 95% of players in college will never play a higher level than the NCAA. So for those guys to have a coach that that teaches them the little things is great. But then you come to the NHL and 
even though some of those players are the same age, Kako being nine, uh, being 19, Lafreniere being 18, it's not the same. These kids are, are earning a million dollars a year. You know, it's a completely different mindset. And and it looks like Galland actually understands this. Galland might not have a long shelf life, but he has proven in the past that he knows how to work with young players. And what I really like about Galland, and I forgot to mention this earlier, I like his approach on the penalty kill because a lot of coaches in the NHL put their best defensive players out there because they think the penalty kill is all about defense. But he's putting the, the players out there that also give him the best chance at scoring a goal. And the Rangers years ago, well, not years ago, but a couple of years ago, had Michael Grabner. Yes! Give me grabs all day. Yes, talk about Grabner, grabs. Grabner was an elite penalty killer. He was amazing. But he was also a threat to score a shorthanded goal. Yep. And... If you can, if you can find the right players to execute that role perfectly, you give yourself a chance to score. And I think under Ellen Vino, they tried it with that ridiculous power kill that Sandra Rosen kept calling it with JT Miller and Kevin Hayes. But JT Miller and Kevin Hayes are not good defensively, not good at, at the time, not good enough defensively to play on the penalty kill. But Galland is trying something with a guy like Kako, who last season proved that he is stellar defensively. Yes. And he also has the offensive skill to make something happen on a breakaway or whatever. It's very Rick Nash-esque to see his utilization now on the penalty kill. Yes, yes. Rick Nash on the penalty kill, Kako Kako on the penalty kill. There are a lot of similarities there. Um, So I'm happy that we see this different approach where Gallant has more than one game plan. And I always felt under David Quinn, there was only one game plan. And it either worked or you lost by four goals. Yep. Um, so Gallant having plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, hopefully will uh, will get us further than, than where we were under David Quinn. Yeah, no, hopefully he's right. And I, just bringing up uh, a little bit more on Gallant, as I alluded to, was the point that just getting these players accountability and comfortability. I feel like you can only go so far with the style that Quinn, you know, obviously adopted and brought with the Rangers. And I just, again, as I've said many times, it really does feel like a breath of fresh air, not just for myself, but you'd have to imagine for these core players, for these veterans that have been on the roster the past couple of years to get this different type of insight, but just naturally just where they can hone in on their own game. You know, we saw the amount of criticism uh, with Capo Caco and David Quinn openly saying how he needs to let him do his game finally, like after a season plus uh, being on the Rangers. It finally clicked to him that this wasn't working and it needs to, considering that this is our young top prospect at the time. Um, the same should apply for everyone. And I think that is exactly where the Rangers are going to get where they need to be by not just trusting themselves when it comes to what they bring on the ice, but trusting one another and just, again, giving that a uh, leeway is going to really bode well for them going forward in my opinion um but with that being said i think we really hit the nail on the head for everything again folks a couple more games left in the preseason then that does it then oh my goodness we actually got hockey to start i'm so excited for that um i'm sure the next episode we do uh we can aim to do the night before the season starts for the rangers i think that'd be a good idea or the day of early in the day either way it's gonna be right around when the season starts it's gonna be very exciting i hope you guys are looking forward to it um but steven do you have any final remarks here before we get into uh, the last 10 minutes or so of q a no i'm just really happy hockey's back yeah it's a, it's a fun time I'm, I'm excited i know i feel best like time of the year. best time of the year i agree out with the end out with the old and with the new that's how I, that I, if you are a fan of multiple sports teams thankfully a lot of them tend to s- stop or start right around the same time that another one begins so it's like i'm done baseball now i'll still be doing my coverage for it but you know physically i won't be watching my favorite team but now i can gel into hockey then we'll have nba which i'm looking forward to as well football season's still going on but i'm very up and down on football season because my steelers i have no clue what to expect (laughs) same here rugby season south africa is over and nhl season in north america starts so perfect bingo exactly uh but that being said folks we're going to open up to q a now for uh the next 
10 minutes or so here before we get out of this episode. Again, thank you all so much that I've been chiming in. We apologize for the obnoxious technical difficulties today. I assure you that we will be on a better note next time we are recording. If we're not, then, you know, you could say that, you know, I'm a liar. And I guess I was. But we're going to try to get it fixed by then. Uh, I see some... Just, so just, just so everyone's aware, the application we normally use to record uses the same servers as Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, which have been down for about two hours. Correct. So. It seems that way because it said when I went to software that it's like, there is, you know what? Let me pull it up right now. Now I'm going to pull it up. Let's see. <coughs> oh, wait, maybe it's it, son of a bitch. It's probably fixed now. It's at, I think it is fixed now. Did we start over? No, I'm just kidding. Oh, no, they didn't. Oh, my God. Okay, I'm going to have to figure out something separately, but I'll worry about that then. Um, okay, so now let's get into questions. Okay, folks. And let's see what everyone has to say. Just give me one second, guys. Where did everything go? Hold on. Did we lose everyone? No, no, everyone's here. I just, I, I lost the chat for a minute. Okay, question time. Um, let's see. I swear there was a question just for you, Stephen. Hold on. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? For me? All right. Of course it's for you. Uh, it said Stephen, I thought. Unless, you know, I'm just reading this wrong. Um, regardless, we are taking questions now, guys. So one question is captaincy. Um, we've talked about it plenty already. Uh, there really isn't too much to expand on it. I think Stephen and I are just both under the agreement it's more than likely going to be Chris Kreider. Um, I think 60-40 Kreider Truba. 64 Kreider. Yeah, that's okay. That's fair. Yeah, I still think it's going to be. I, I, I still stand by the notion. I think it'll be Kreider come opening night for the Rangers. Um, <laughs> why isn't. The question, the question I have for you how will they announce it? Uh, I think they're going to. If it were uh, up to me, I would let the captain, whoever it is, skate out first on opening night. They might be slick and do it like that, but something also tells me the day of Rangers opening night against dc they're gonna come out with like a really dope like highlight video and it's gonna be like Kreider like turning around and the c's on his jersey uh, how lame would it be to announce a captain on the road though fair fair but why would you just, but just why go, but go, are go, they gonna go wait a game to do it though i don't think they're gonna wait uh, a game to do go it with three alternates for the for, for the first game <laughs> and then game two against dallas your home opener and you have to captain skate out first i don't i don't think that's gonna happen I, I I like your idea. It's not gonna happen, but it should happen. Okay, fair fair enough. I, I respect that opinion for sure. Uh, but no less, we do think it's gonna be Kreider. Kreider will go off sides on us for a shift. Hey, give the give the man some time at least. My goodness, everyone's out here. Um, why isn't uh twelve given the same chance as seventy two? That being why isn't Gautier given the same opportunities as Heedle? Circumstances are beyond different. Um, One thing. Uh, uh, twelve is now Patrick Nemeth. Gautier is now number fifteen. Oh, that's a great point. So, yes, we're not talking about Nemeth, though. He's referring to Gauthier. I know he is. Um, and I just noticed the number changed the other night, too. But, yeah, Gauthier, uh, I think the reasoning as to why he isn't given the same, uh, you know, <coughs> opportunity as Heedle is the obvious one is Gauthier is not a center. Heedle is. So he's he naturally gets that lock kind of on that third line. Uh, it's easy to forget that heedle has been a part of this team for a while now. You know, like – he has really been with the Rangers for a bit now, and he's only in his early 20s. So while he hasn't necessarily done anything crazy, he's still been inconsistent, has dealt with some injuries for sure. Uh, he's proven himself for what the Rangers' role for him currently is versus Gauthier, who unfortunately suffers a logjam in that right wing spot. Also, uh, I don't know if you know this, but uh, Philip Hedl is the third longest tenured Ranger on the team. Is he really? Chris Cryer wow. in 2012, Zubanejad in 2016, and the third longest is Hedl, who made his debut in 2018. That's crazy. I, it that really, is, it's, it's so bizarre. That is pretty crazy, yes. It's time flies, man. It really does. Throughout this whole rebuild, I felt like in the blink of an eye. Rory. Yeah, Gauthier, Gauthier just has the bad luck that he plays. Look, when Gauthier was acquired... Um, Vitaly Kravtsov was bolting back to Russia. Kapo Kako was finishing the worst 
rookie season of a second overall pick ever. Um, there was no <laughs> confirmation that Chris Kreider would actually stay or go. And the Rangers had not won the 2020 draft lottery to draft Alexi Lafreniere. So when the Rangers acquired Julian Gauthier, the outlook on the wing was vastly different than it was a year later. I think that's also an important distinction. Yeah. The situation since Gauthier was acquired changed drastically. And Gauthier just lost the battle. Yep. Yeah, and, and it's unfortunate. You know, you and I are both pretty heavy Julian Gauthier advocates, but... Again, we'll see what the future holds on his front, but no less, I, I think we broke down pretty simply exactly why Heedle's in a different spot than where Julian is to this point in their careers with the Rangers. Um, a no. couple more questions now, folks. I see, let's see here. Um, one of Laffy, Krasov, or Kako must be on the top power play. Uh, thoughts? Yes. I think yes. Um, mainly because I would like one of those left-hand shots in the right dot. I think Lafreniere might be the most appealing for that power play number one, personally. Um, I want that cross-crease, one-time pass ability between Zibanejad and, say, uh, Parmi and, say, Lafreniere. I'm not one that's in far love, as we talked before, with Zibanejad and Panarin on the same power play, but even if they're going to be, I'd rather have uh, Panarin potentially working more so the middle and having Zibanejad working the right side. Um, I know that you're not going to really have as much of a net front presence because of it, but I, I personally, I would just like a left-hand shot on the right dot. What about you, Steven? Um, yeah, I don't know who will necessarily be the best fit on that top power play unit, but I would definitely try out all three. Um, I'd probably move Zibanejad to the second power play unit. Um have strong take the face-offs on um, power play unit one. Kreider still in front of the net. Panarin on the left. One of the one of the young kids on the right. And then Fox um, quarterbacking. Yeah. Yeah. No, and that and that's fair. And again, I just I really hope that throughout the season we get uh cons consistency, not just with the uh, you know, the normal lines, one through four offensively. But also on the power play, I, I just I genuinely want to see uh, one of those youngsters in the right dot. Give them some time. Uh, I think now is the time to kind of give them that opportunity too. And if they don't exceed, then you know go back to all the already mindset, if you will, if that's something that you feel you must do. But I would try to definitely avoid it at first. Um, let's see. <clears throat> will Schneider get a chance with the Rangers? Yes, but I don't think it'll happen this season. Um, I think Schneider will play some games with the Rangers. I don't think it's going to be the majority of games. And it has nothing to do with Schneider, but more to do with the Rangers' depth and how difficult it is for defensemen at that age to break through. Um, I looked this up a couple of weeks ago. Since 2006, only seven defensemen uh, drafted from the WHL have played at least 40 games in their, in their second season after being drafted. And five of those were top 10 picks. The other two were Tyler Myers and Brendan Carlo. So mm -hmm. it's very rare for a player out of the WHL to get drafted and then be an NHL regular in their second season. Yeah. You know, exactly. It and it take longer. It's that simple. And Schneider, I will say, however, when he got drafted, um, something that I think that I've proved you wrong slightly, just how long it would take him to get to the NHL. And it seems like he's a little ahead of schedule. Wouldn't you agree? Um, yeah, he's impressed me. Um, I wish he would have gotten a little bit more of a shot in Hartford last season. Fair. Um, but <laughs> you know, uh, it wasn't, it was a weird season, so I don't hold it against him. Um, I just wanted to have a good season in Hartford and then work his way up. Uh, the timeline for me for Schneider was always going to be 2023 or 2024, which would line up perfectly with Truba's no move clause expiring. But we might have to force that a little bit. Um, I still think in two years, our right side on defense is going to be Fox, Lundqvist, Schneider. Yeah, which means that Jacob Truba was traded. It happens. Players get traded. Players oh, move absolutely. Move, still get traded. Yep. Hey. Gary and Gabrick waived his no, no trade clause to go to Columbus. Mm-hmm. 
And look how that turned out for Columbus. <laughs> Short lived. Look how, look how it turned out for Gabrick. He won a cup a year later with LA. Yep. I know. That, that that wasn't fun being on the wrong end of that one. But again, we're not trying to be upset today. So stop it. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was one part of a six year stint where every year a former Angel won a cup. Oh, of course. I, yeah, the only ones that unfortunately did not get that luxury were the Ryan Callahan, Brian Boyle, Dan Girardi era of Tampa Bay, you know? Yeah. Which is unfortunate for their sake, for sure. But uh, at, least McDonough, at least McDonough got two. So. Yes, at, rightfully so for Mack Truck. We love him. Um, two more questions here. I think we're going to get out of here for today's episode, folks. Uh, one of them is, does Barron start off in the in the minors just to give him playing time rather than Ryan away being scratched? Luke, you answered you answered your own question. That's 100% right. I think that's exactly what both Steven and I and I think the Rangers are expecting going into the season. And I think... I think and hope the same will happen to Lundqvist or Jones, whoever doesn't make it, because I would rather have a 20 or 21 year old defenseman play top minutes in the AHL than to sit in the press box at Madison Square Garden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I, I agree with you for sure. Um, and you know what? You know what? On, on weekdays, <laughs> they can always call them up, have them train with the team. It's fine. Who cares? But when it comes to playing, let them play in Hartford. Let them get their minutes. That's how they develop. Exactly. And that's important for them and their development more than anything. The same, the same goes for Baron. Baron is just the only forward left that's waiver exempt. So it makes the decision very easy. Yeah. No, exa exactly. You're 100% right. Um, so now one more, one or two more we'll get to here. I see. Uh, where is Will Cooley? Uh, Cooley has is done with the Rangers. Uh, he will be starting the year juniors once again. Um, he's not able to play in Hartford, as we talked about previously, because he does not reach the full requirements to be with the Wolfpack just yet. Uh, but he should be able to uh, be with them full-time next, starting next season. Um, yeah. Speaking of embarrassment of wealth, Statboy has a jersey collection only rivaled by the hockey guy. Um, except Statboy's got the rare heat. <laughs> no, you're at, yeah, no, Statboy has an amazing jersey collection. If you couldn't tell just by the handful of, you know, the like 1% of what he's got on the wall behind him. He's got, how many jerseys do you think you have now? Uh, 91. 91? I actually counted them on Saturday. A friend of mine came <laughs> over to work to Bruins game, so we counted them. Wow. I, I counted them before he got here. I was just curious. That's some closet. It's got to be some closet, <laughs> unless it's like a whole room, or do you just have a whole room for them? No, 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 they're in a closet now. Okay, got I, it. I, you know, I, I have to, I have to, I still have to figure out a permanent spot for them. But uh, yeah, I put the uh, the the Jones and the Lundqvist jersey up, you know, because we're we we're gonna talk about those two. Yeah, um, no, you did, and I love how you beautifully put six and nine next to each other. You, know, you right? nice. We we just noticed that now. It don't it don't. I, I blame the poor camera quality through Zoom for not picking up on that sooner. But yeah, beautifully placed by Stephen. If you know, you know. But with that being said, folks, I think that's gonna wrap up this episode of Rangers Review. Thank you all so much, everybody that chimed in. Again, we apologize once more for the technical difficulties, but everything should be back and ready to go next episode. A week from now, right either on opening day for the Rangers, um, you know, opening night or the day before. Either way, we will get a new episode for you then. But plenty of things to be excited about the season ahead, folks. Thank you all so much again. Thank you so much for chiming in for your questions, all that fun stuff. And we will have the next episode available, not just live, but also through podcast form too. So thank you again, guys. And Steven, as always, my friend, let's go Rangers. Let's go Rangers.